Um, okay. Um, I want to start with uh, posing a sort of foundational question in the um, subversive theory theory, which is what conspiracy theories are. And um, in the way that I want to pose the question um, in this foundational sense, um, we pose it in two ways. Um, we can ask about the cultural artifacts, but our conspiracy theories, what they are, in a sense, what cultural category they belong to, what ontological category they belong to, and so on. And we can ask about the attitudes of engagement, the conspiratorial attitudes, um, what kind of mental type they are. And uh, then there's an orthodox answer to this question, which is that um, as cultural artifacts, uh, conspiracy theories are explanations and as mental attitudes, their beliefs. Um, and if that's true, then conspiracy theories are extremely valuable. Um, they're in the business of truth, you might say. Um, and that's what I call the elite hypothesis. Other people call that the classic hypothesis that just equivalent. You can ask me about that in the q if you want to. Um, and I, I want to say that that, that um, view is not only orthodox in a systemic sense, in a, in a sort of um, systematic philosophical sense, it's also orthodox, I think, in a slightly political sense that it infiltrates um, major research grants on conspiracy theories. Um, it infiltrates their titles, say, and in a balanced debate uh, in the Chomsky uh, sense. It sets up um, the playing field as it were. As it were. And um, I think the orthodox answer is wrong, um, but I don't have time to show uh, that it's wrong. So instead, what I want to do is I uh, want to level the playing field by just suggesting an alternative answer and putting it next to the orthodox answer. And the alternative answer is that the conspiracy theories are not to that member states um, and they have non cognitive contents. And the particular type of answer I want to um, defend, the narrative model, as I call it, says that they are fictions. Um, and so the corresponding attitudes are attitudes of fiction. And in order to do that, I'm just going to give you three, in the handout there's more, but just three um, features of conspiracy discourse that you encounter a lot when you engage with um, communities that are engaged in telling and uh, receiving the conspiracy theories. And those the, and um, I'm going to say that those three features sort of suggest an alternative model, and I'm going to sketch it briefly. Okay, so the three features are, the first one is motivational inefficacy. Um, so that's the phenomenon that um, lots of conspiracy beliefs are motivationally cut off from the rest of the mental system of the agents. Um, and you can tell uh, that by just looking at um, what they do. So um, if people believe, believe um, that lizard people are controlling uh, society from the hollow earth, um, that, that was a belief, would have to have some kind of influence on what they do, but most of them just continue living their life, lives, their families, they go shopping, um, and so, so on and so forth. So there seems to be some um, motivator and nervous there. The second feature is what I call simplification or distortion. Um, and that's the phenomenon that um, the way that typical uh, conspiracy theories are presented diverges significantly in a very characteristic way from how actual conspiracies play out. So actual conspiracies play out um, often involving a lot of coincidence, involving a lot of structural and systemic features. Um, and not involving much powerful individual agency. Uh, so one good example for this is the DW scandal. Um, from what we know about how that conspiracy uh, played out is that it is mostly due to systemic factors in the structure of the uh, DW uh, company and not much to a diabolical group of people getting together and just sort of deciding together in an act of individual agency um, that they're gonna uh, aspire to, to uh, manipulate the, the software. And the third point, um, that's a point um, that I call nitpicking. Um, 
that is uh, a point about engaging with conspiracy communities. Um, and if you've ever done that in, in depth, you will have found that there's a curious thing that happens where if you insist too much on some of the minute details of their theories, there'll be an, a characteristic impatience with you. Um, they'll, they'll think it's sort of insisting on, on these details is sort of besides the point. It's a kind of nitpicking on your part if you insist, you know, how exactly uh, did the Americans engineer the, virus, the coronavirus? That's not, that doesn't matter. Somehow they did. That seems to be often um, the consensus. Okay, there are some others on the handout, but I'm, stick, I'm gonna stick with those. Um, some of these features um, aren't captured by elithic models, models that call it elithic hypothesis at all, I think. For example, um, the uh, simplification distortion stuff is sort of just outside its bounds, as it were. Um, the nitpicking stuff, perhaps, as well. And some are only captured um, if you have to, if, if you commit yourself to the hypothesis that something about conspiracy theorizing um, is deeply irrational. Um, and as, as we know, we perhaps don't want to do that. That has sort of adverse effects, even in the in societal discourse, but also as a, as a theory, it might not be a good idea to uh, imply systemic irrationality for all people who engage with conspiracy theories. And so it would be a good thing if we had a theory that captured these phenomena um, without doing that. Um, okay, and that's what I want to sketch now. This is what I call the narrative model. And the narrative model is just based on um, Henry Walton's uh, theory of fiction, just because it's famous and I like it. Um, you can have other models of this sort if you have other theories of fiction. Fine by me. And the core idea here is just that conspiracy theories, as I said, are not explanations or theories. They're fictions, they're stories, they're narratives. Um, and correspondingly, beliefs in conspiracy theories um, are not beliefs in the standard sense, and they're attitudes of fictional engagement. They're what you experience when you um, engage with attitudes. And the way this works is, um, so let's take a sentence that we, uh, that in the orthodox model, you would say, uh, works with belief. So for example, say, Alex believes that Lyndon Johnston had Kennedy killed. That's sort of the core claim of the conspiracy theory that um, Alex uh, supposedly believes. In the fictional model, in the narrative model, um, that would read, um, that, that would mean basically um, that Alex is engaged in a complex game. Um, such that if he's engaged in that game, it's as if he believed Johnson had Kennedy killed. And that's sort of a, a game of make belief. That means um, Alex also imagines a world, a fictional world, in which it's true that uh, Johnson had Kennedy killed. And, and that's an important bit. Um, Alex imagines a world in which Johnson's secret order explains the uh, death of Kennedy. So, the suggestion isn't that we're explaining something real by posing a fiction, because that would be just confusing fiction and fact. It's that the explanation itself that is posed um, is part of the fiction, so it's, as it were, not real. Um, and the, the last bit that, that Walton uses a lot to explain uh, his theory is um, use props to engage with fictions. Um, and uh, in, in the case of, of sort of narrative fictions, the props are the propositions of uh, the, the cultural artifact that you're engaging with. So in Alex's case, you would be using the propositions or the, the contents of the conspiracy theory to engage with that fiction. Um, Last but not least, um, that means that uh, just as Walton explains, what explains is with a, the case of someone watching a horror movie, they watch the movie, they feel fear. Is it real fear? No, says Walton, is a kind of quasi fear because 
um, because it's a kind of simulated state. It mimics some properties of fear, but it's only fear and fiction. Um, <coughs> and so it's not the real state, it's not the real thing. So correspondingly, um, what the narrative model of conspiracy theories would do is it would um, say that people who engage with them have quasi beliefs. Yeah, so they're not the real thing, not real beliefs, but they mimic some of the properties of beliefs. So um, that, of course, can explain what I've called features of conspiracy discourse in sort of one fell swoop. Because um, remember, they're simplified and distorted, and they're motivationally inefficacious. Engagements with uh, conspiracy theories are, well, um, if um, they're fictional attitudes, then that's exactly what we should expect. Because exactly the point of fictions, of games, is to be cut off from the rest of the mental system, because they're sort of simulations of things, not the real things. But we're really bad if they weren't cut off, right? Because then if you're watching a horror movie, um, every time you do, you'd be calling the police, or at least you'd be to this, this close to it. And um, that wouldn't work out very well. And of course they're um, distorted. And of course they're distorted in just um, this characteristic way, which the conspiracy theories are distorted. Because, you know, fictions need to be dramatic, but they need, they, they need certain marks, and then they, they need to be exaggerated in order for you to get into the fiction, as it were. Um, and then finally, um, remember that my third point was that um, when you engage with conspiracy theorists, you often get a kind of nitpicking charge. Well, if conspiracy theories are fictions, then that charge is, is actually justified, because what you're doing um, when you are sort of uh, picking out the minute details of the theory, you are nitpicking it. So imagine someone who watches a James Bond movie and who insists that it's somehow somehow not possible that James Bond went from Barbados to uh, America. How did he get there? You know, that's not the point. The point is that the fiction claims that he did. And as long as the fiction, there, there's no internal incoherence there, and you could just maintain that in the fiction. So fictions can have gaps and stuff like that. And people who insist, um, that obsessively insist that um, the, the fiction must fill those gaps, those people haven't understood the nature of the fiction and probably nature of fiction in general, they're nitpickers. And so if, you, if, if this is all true, then it's to be expected that um, conspiracy theories will meet you with the charge of nitpicking. Um, I have some consequences of this on, on the handout, but um, I want to hear what people have to say, so I'll just stop there um, and you can ask me about the consequences uh, in the Q&A or on the coffee break. Thank you.